we are the Central Vermont Career Center School District Board meeting, Monday, June 10th. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Um, we have a quorum. And do we have any guests? Yes. Hello. <laughs> um, and we will, um, re the, the agreement of the norms that we all, on the, on the third page, um, counting the back pages, Anyone have any questions about those norms? Right, that's what we adhere to through the course of our meeting. We will go forward from there. Um, any public comments or correspondence? Any correspondence for anyone? Any public comments? Anyone here from the public who would like to comment, either online or in the room? Not hearing any, we will continue to move forward. We have an agenda. Um, we need to approve this agenda. Are there any um, corrections or additions to this agenda as we see it? If not, I'd like to have a motion to approve this agenda. So moved. All right. uh, moved by Jim, second by Jana. Any discussion on the agenda? All those in favor? Aye. Say aye. aye. All those opposed? Hearing no opposition, motion carries. Our agenda is in place. We have the consent agenda. In the packet, there were the minutes from May 13th, 2024, May 23rd, 2024, um, personnel updates, some new hires, uh, design and fabrication instructor, welding instructor. Any, um, I need a, a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. So moved. Um, a second? Second. Second. Um, any discussion? Do you just want to name for us the design and um, fabrication instructor and the welding instructor? Sure, these are staff that we have with us right now, but they started after August 1st, so they were not offered a contract when the rest of our staff were. So it's Giuliano Ceccanelli for design and fabrication and Brian Matat for welding. Very good. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? Hearing no opposition, the consent agenda is adopted. Board reports. Student representatives to the board. Our student is working again. <laughs> and okay. I asked for someone else from student leadership to show up, and it looks like we either didn't get the message out or didn't have any volunteers. Okay. They are, there are several spe students speaking later this week at our end of year awards, though. So okay. we look forward to them then. All right. Um, program <laughs> presentation. Our medical professions, uh, Dr. Geneve, Geneve, very good, Dr. Geneve Jocelyn, um, and we'll invite you to come within range and give your presentation. Is it possible we get the slides up or no? Did you send them to me? Um, yes. <laughs> I did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just a minute. Um, <laughs> um, I'm usually well in advance. I figured you did. I can. I just didn't want to. While we're waiting, my do you want to just tell us what medical professions encompasses? Sure. Do, do I need to move, or am I okay? It's just hard to hear. Maybe you. if you came over between. Rows of three, two, three. <laughs> 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 okay. um, so yeah, medical professions is designed as a program for students to explore all sorts of different healthcare careers. So some students come in with really clear ideas of what they like to do. This year I have a student really interested in radiology tech, ultrasound technician. I have a student who's going to see a physical therapist. And then it's also for students who know they want to be in healthcare but are not exactly sure where they want to be. So part of the program is exploring all the different opportunities in healthcare and then building those foundational skills that they need to kind of move on the field. Yeah, so it's for 11th and 12th graders. This year I have mostly 11th graders. I have four seniors, but it's often a mix of the two. The 11th graders will either come back to CVCC for another program, like emergency services or cooperative education, um, or they'll go on to early college, which is more common. 
So I'm going to talk about a variety of things, and you can kind of kick me out any time if I'm going too long. Um, this is kind of what we're going to discuss. Um, so currently, the program offers six college credits, Introduction to Healthcare and Human Biology through CCP. Um, and then there's a list that the AOE puts out every year for additional college offerings. And I usually have between two and five students who will take up that opportunity of taking an additional college course. Um, so this year, medical terminology was one of the ones offered, and I had two students take that additional course, which is great because it's not taught by me. It's taught by a CCB instructor. So it's a good way for them to kind of put their toe in to not having me teaching them. But I can also support them. Is that um, college-based? Is it like a college-based course? It is. Yeah, so the ones that I teach are college courses as well, um, but then they can take additional ones that are a little more structured, like it's the normal 12 or 15 weeks online kind of thing. Um, so this year, 100% of students earn six college credits, and then 16% earn nine. So we had 12 students earning a total of 78 credits. So that's what happened this year. And the plan um, for not next year but the year after is to add, to, to remove Introduction to Healthcare and Human Biology and to do Anatomy and Physiology 1 and 2 through UTC. Um, the, uh, the hospital really wants us to teach AP because it, they get to get an employee who's already taken that class, they don't have to pay for it, um, and they're, they're kind of that much higher level understanding of that content area. Um, CCV does not allow us to teach anatomy and physiology through fast forward, and so I'm, I'm through the credentialing process at BTC, and I just need to submit a syllabus, and so we'll be ready to go in 25, 6, right? FY26. Correct. Yes. Okay. I don't want to change it because the current students that have applied do not know they're taking that, and I feel like that would be kind of unfair to just be like, by the way, <laughs> taking this really just so we had a lot of Central Vermont Medical Center collaborations this year. We had our first ever cooperative education student who worked at the hospital as a phlebotomy tech. Um, it was kind of a pilot. We've never had one before. We worked with them for three years to adjust their hiring um, guidelines to be less than 18 years of old age because most healthcare facilities require you to be 18, which prevented our students from participating in cooperative education. Um, she, it was the first job that she had ever had in her life, and it's a very professional, intense job to go into. And she did quite well considering all of that, all of those expectations. Um, we don't have any students for next year for co-op, but it definitely paved the way. And the lab director there actually reached out to a few of our students who passed their CPTs, asking them to interview for the position. So we're really building a relationship with them, which is great. Um, we had um, two clinics in the conference room at the hospital, draw <coughs> clinics, and our cooperative education student helped volunteer to run those, which was great. We had two um, students who graduated previously who now work at the hospital come to volunteer, so that was super fun. And a lot of <coughs> staff members from the hospital volunteered to be um, sample patients for the So that was great. Um, also, our um, emergency services two students supported the first draw clinic. The students really need someone standing right next to them in the beginning, and I'm only one person, and so I brought Carl Madison as well as his um, paramedicine students with us, and they were hugely helpful in supervising students. Um, so we did over 300 live draws between those clinics and our lab this year. We also partnered with CBMC and CBMC do an access day specifically for health science students and so that was really exciting. Um, they got to see respiratory therapy and all sorts of different people and do mock classes at CCB. So those were um, new. So the field trips we get our host of uh, spring and fall conference, our access day, um, we went to um, life and helped us organize this amazing opportunity for students to learn how to care for patients suffering from addiction. It was designed for healthcare providers and it was a really amazing presentation. Um, I hope we, get, we have opportunities to do it in the future. 
We also went to Margaret Pratt and learned about assisted living and memory care, which was very eye-opening for the students. Um, we talked a lot about how the quality of care that we would like to see in assisted living and memory care is not always exactly what is reality. And so it was, um, I think Margaret Pratt does a really excellent job, but it was also um, very eye-opening for the students to see kind of what ends up life care can look like. So that was there. Um, we also did a high horses equine therapy field trip recently, which was really amazing for students to see occupational therapy, physical therapy, and mental health therapy being done partnering with horses. Mm -hmm. So that was great. And then our job clinics. Um, so I am, first of all, just incredibly grateful for the board and administration and that we have this here, the vision um, and the work that's been done to allow me to do this work in the classroom is really significant. So thank you. Um, the MedPro Jedi statement, I think you saw, whoever saw my presentation last year, the um, Medical Professions Advisory Board put together a vision statement for equity and inclusion and what that looks like. And this year, partnering with LIFE and Emergency Services 1 and 2, we were able to explore so many different topics that we either didn't have the time or the support or the kind of culture to, be able to talk about before. So we attended UVM's Health Equity Summit. We did the Caring for People with Addiction. We did a, t a teen mental health training. Um, Life came in and taught racism and country music, a media literacy, and wealth and equality lesson. And just recently, in, in, towards the end of the year, we did a Caring for Transgender Patient Unit, which was, um, I'm not sure that we could have done it with the success that we had, had we not done all of this stuff already with students. So we had built the foundation of taking care of yourself, communicating respectfully, asking questions, curiosity. We had built the foundation of exploring nuanced, complicated topics with respect for differences in opinions. Um, and it went really well. So I'm grateful mm -hmm. for all of that. Um, yeah, so our goals for next year are to, um, so we're using the um, justice standards, the national justice standards, and ideally, I think they would be in Canvas and we'd be evaluating them so that we have evidence of students meeting those expectations. And so my hope is for next year that we can get some of those justice standards into Canvas and I can tag them to an assignment. Um, so we're still using our exposure management plan that we put together and many other centers have asked us for it. So I think that's good news that other people are using them as well. Um, and then we have an invasive procedure waiver that students and volunteers sign as well as parents and guardians. In the past um, two years with the CPT, we've had two needle sticks which have occurred with sterile needles on trainers. Um, that's where we want them to happen if they're going to happen. <laughs> we want them on the trainers, not on live blood. And we've had two episodes of syncope or basophagal um, reaction. And that has been with live blood on mostly students from other programs, not in health science, but in volunteer. And so Joey and I have discussed to limit our student volunteers to the health science cluster next year. Um, people, the students are so willing and so happy to volunteer and it may not be the most appropriate thing for mm -hmm. every student to do, even with parent parental mm -hmm. consent. So that's, um, and we review that management plan yearly at the moment. It may become every other year. When we first um, created it, we kind of wanted to see, like, we might need to check in after a year and make sure this is working. So one of the challenges that um, I'm having with medical Professions is that I have students, all of which who want to go on to healthcare, many of which come in not at grade level in terms of literacy and math. Mm -hmm. And so I'm having to work collaboratively with everyone here to move the needle sometimes one, two, three grade levels, um, which is tricky. And so um, it's also been exceptionally difficult without having a literacy and math interview interventionist um, and so although the work he scores are showing improvement there I'm not seeing as much improvement as I would like to see in terms of students math assessments um, and although they are demonstrating growth in reading comprehension and writing 
I'm not a literacy teacher, and so I know they're not where they should be, but I don't always know what exactly has to be done in order to move them forward. And so my plan for next year, after talking with Jody, is to pilot um, this kind of four areas of health science that are really important for student success. One of them is anatomy and physiology, and we're gonna use visible body, which is a textbook lab software that CCB uses for anatomy and physiology. One is medical terminology, because it's like learning a new language, and students, even when they read questions in the licensing exam, if they don't know the medical term, they can't answer the question, so it's really important. Um, and then one is critical reading and analysis, and I'm going to pilot Lexia Power Up um, to, and have students work daily for a period of time, hopefully with support from a literacy teacher, um, to build those skills. And then Alex, can you so, um, to help, it gives them an assessment, it checks what level they're at, and then it feeds them lessons tailored to their skill level. Mm -hmm. Um, and that would really help me because right now I'm teaching like fifth, sixth grade math, which most medical math is, but I have students who haven't developed fluency yet in their math facts. And so I'm having to go back and teach them fluency, which is very challenging to do when I've got someone that's taking calculus and then like there are people that are still trying to work within tens of big fractions. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, in, I'm very just curious how can we bring students up to grade level as quickly and efficiently as possible so that they can go to early college and be successful, um, or go to college and be successful. So I'm gonna see how this works. It's a grand experiment. Yes. It was really interesting, because I sat in that time when, yes. and it was such a great session, but you had a literacy interventionist there. And I just was thinking about the difference between developing the literacy skills for just on the decoding level and then how you look at it at the deeper comprehension level, you know, are you going to have to start coming in and teaching Latin and Greek to <laughs> students and Greek combining forms to teach them medical vocabulary? So a lot of med term is that. It's yeah. uh, prefixes and suffixes and roots, and we do do a lot of that work. Um, and I've looked at it in the past as teaching a unit, like here we're learning med term all together, we're learning this all together, and what I've, I've talked to a bunch of actually elementary school teachers who use this model, where they have students rotate through four groups, mm -hmm. they plop themselves at the group, and then they get a sense really quickly, and they can also group students based on ability and what they need. And so I'm thinking that this could be worth trying um, so that I can, the students who need to memorize those vocabulary words, right. they can work on that. And right. the students that need more work on prefixes and suffixes, we can work on that. Um, so I'm hopeful. I'm going to try yeah. it. Yeah. Along yeah. with three column notes. For, yes, oh, right. all of it. Yeah. All of it. And they get pretty good in MedPro with reading and summarizing. Um, and the reading comprehension, they really need to get good at because yeah. so much of it is that. Um, but there are students who, when they write, there's grammatical holes in, in their understanding. Um, and I'm not literacy teacher and so I think it'll be super helpful to have someone here too that can come in and kind of say okay these are the skills that we need the student to build. So how much goes back to the sending schools that says you know we love your students this is great we're moving forward it would be really helpful if there could be a greater concentration on A, B, C, and D. <clears throat> yeah, we were just asked to add the prerequisite skills into our program of studies, which I think is a really great idea. Like, here are the things we'd like you to have. Like, I will remember when we required that all students that came to MedPro had biology and had all of these things, we had like seven <coughs> applicants. Mm -hmm. And so the students who are killing it at their studying schools and taking AP chemistry are not necessarily the students that are applying into right. the program. And I do feel we kind of have this amazing opportunity to serve students who need that extra support to get where they want to go. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the healthcare industry, we need students who are not quite there but can get there because we can't fill the jobs. And so I think the bigger picture is how do we move them to where we need them to be? Then how do we make sure they have everything they need before they get here? 
Well, at least some foundation. Yeah, and some of them have it. Many of them do. Others have slipped through the cracks and just haven't haven't built those skills. I mean, I have students every single year. They put in there. They start to do their work, and I have to have them capitalize I every single year. Go back, do it again, capitalize the I, use the punctuation. This is how you use a semicolon, which is fine. It's, it's not a big deal, but I think we could amplify that effect with more literacy intervention and more math intervention. Good questions. Thank Does there you. need yeah. to be a, geez, a minimum, some type of evaluation of the student before they come aboard to know what you need to focus yeah. on? Because what you're doing is great, but you're watering down. Right. From my perspective. So <coughs> your time. Lexia your and Alex will do that. It'll give us an assessment of where they're at and then it gives them targeted interventions for where they need to grow. Work Keys does give us this information, but that curriculum that Work Keys offers, I'm not fully sure it moves the needle much at all. So you have Lexia, you have I'm gonna try it next okay, year. Okay, good. Yeah. We're going to try Lexia and then Alex and see see what happens. And what's really nice about the model we have here is they're with us every day for four hours the whole year. And so we can get them to do things that they don't, they wouldn't do, I don't think, otherwise. Um, they just, you know, you build the relationship, they like it here, they are interested, they're motivated, and I think, I, I feel pretty confident that I can get them invested, yes. that this is going to help you be successful in what you would like to do. Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah. think I've ever asked this question, but is, is homework a thing? It's a great question. <laughs> yeah. Um, so... <laughs> when we were growing up, yes. Yeah. It was. <laughs> so this, in my experience, the students who do homework do better. They do better in the program. I don't require them to do homework because they, most of them won't do it. Um, so it's a, I do a much of a flipped classroom model where I'm helping them with their work um, and that seems to create <coughs> more success. I'm amazed every year at the work that students do. And every year they say, I have never worked so hard and I have never done so much work in my life. And I'm like, good, keep doing it. <laughs> yeah. Because um, life they, isn't easy. And a lot of them work, a lot of them leave at 12.30 and they go home yeah. and they work till 8 p.m. And then they work on the weekends. And so sometimes it's not that they wouldn't do homework, but their lives are not conducive to that in any capacity. Right. The only reason I ask is if you're trying to catch up three or four years of math. And that's a lot to do in four hours a day and right. go forward. With yeah. And I think the one thing that's good about these two Alex, platforms, Alex they is could great. do it at home. They could, they could actually do it at home. Yes. But and it also sounds like yeah. it isn't just math; it's grammar. It's, it's, it's not. It's not just the one yeah. thing. It's, it's wow. Just feel. I did, would never have thought that that, they, that we're getting that that they're failing somewhere else down the line to feed you. And that's my question, just to follow up on that. Have you ever inventoried or have an idea of an inventory of what the needs are and shared that with the local schools so that, for example, if commas are taught in the, in the fifth grade, um, that you're seeing it with 11th graders, that they haven't mastered the comma? Or they've overmastered or whatever. But I mean, but, 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 but you see where I'm going with that. Have you shared that with the local schools so that they, in turn, can backtrack to make sure that commas, everyone is good with commas by the time they leave the fifth grade? I mean, I would. We say send our work piece course. I'm not the first teacher that's noticed it in their journey. Yeah. Yes. I yeah. think people are, have a lot going on and they're overwhelmed and it's hard to catch all of it and then hard to do the intervention. This will give me more information. Mm -hmm. Like, where actually exactly are they? Because work keys, I wouldn't say gives us the level of detail that we need. We know where they are generally, but it's not necessarily here are the exact skills that they need. Right. But those, I'm sure, if, if there's school, students who are coming to the Career Center, 
there are also students who are not coming to the career centers who still have not mastered those skills and what is becoming of them that's a real important piece to know that I think the local schools would want to know. I have yet to meet a single student who knows what APA formatting is, which is used in all science, social, psychology, and, and medicine. Yes. I, which is flabbergasting to me. Like, how do you not know this? But that's okay. So, it's I'm, not okay. I'm wondering, that's the problem. It's not okay. I'm trying to be <laughs> so, yeah. what I'm wondering is, before you even get to the commas, but it's I'm not dissing the comments. <laughs> yeah, I just right. want to get that clear. <laughs> what I want to know is do they have the motor fluency to even write a sentence so that they can express themselves at a level of, of maturity? You know, because if you're not motorically, if you don't have those fast graphical motor skills, you don't think necessarily at, at higher levels or more abstract, you know. So I'm just wondering, with pencil in hand, taking notes, I mean, is everybody at a keyboard? Is everybody fluent and automatic? It's but do you question. have motor yeah. fluency promotes higher level in, thinking? In, in MedPro, they're required to take notes by hand. They do a lot of note taking. Yes. Well, but I'm not sure that they've done that before. They, I don't think we've all done that before. Does before anyone know cursive? I'm not sure. I don't, we're not collecting data on that. So and are they know. printing, or does anyone know cursive anymore? I mean, because if yeah. you want motor I don't know fluency. <laughs> It's not even something they learn anymore. I know Steph teaches it's her current class. <laughs> 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 you know, Janine, you just read my mind. I, yeah. I put my hand up because our students actually asked me um, this year. It was really, really sweet of them. They they pulled me aside. They're like, this is really embarrassing. They're like, can you, we want to learn two things. And I was like, okay. They're like, we want to le learn how to read an analog clock because we don't know how to, and we would like to learn how to uh, right in cursive. So um, Tim and I tag teamed and um, yeah, our, our kids have to write in cursive now for their assignments. <laughs> but yeah, they asked and they they need practice, they need practice, they need practice. And they're all highly capable, highly intelligent students who can learn it. They, what they I'm really ga I gather out of this though is you, you spend an inordinate amount of time teaching them basic math and grammar skills and so on and so forth when you're supposed to be teaching them. I actually don't spend an enormous amount of time doing it. I wish I had more time to do it. I do like this much of it and then feel anxious about it the rest of the year. That's all so I'm hoping that these two things will really enhance mm -hmm. enhance them and move the needle a little bit. That's my hope because many of them, they need to take a college level math class to be successful in nursing and all right. of these things. <laughs> Organic chem. Can I really oh, quickly? Um, you mentioned before um, interventionists, and, and I'm wondering to what degree is literacy or math intervention available here? And if the answer is zero, then we started with a, a literacy interventionist and a STEM coordinator. Yeah. The STEM coordinator was done in September, like left, and the literacy interventionist left in January and we were unable to fill them. Mm -hmm. Next year we have a STEM person, Embedded Academic STEM. Mm -hmm. We renamed it and we, we shifted the job description. We do not have an Embedded Academics Humanities, which would include literacy. So, and it's been a very limited pool. Yeah. And although my are like dual certification is yeah. required, so. Not high school. But the, and the, but the pool that we have to actually get this is so small, and like this is like yeah. not even a one percent of the population. So like it is a big thing, but yeah, just because really hard to take our this small pool and say your sending schools are failing us. I mean, yeah, it's, it's not really hard to put that. But into but they it. are. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I can't yeah. argue I mean, that. But I'm and just I mean saying not just that. at this level. I mean, if you want to start at the beginning, when we look at the literacy levels of students, but we don't—we all know that. And, and the thing you hit, hit on, Doctor. My daughter's going into her sophomore year in, in college in med, pre-med, Latin, the advanced math, like all of that had to be part of her curriculum to be able to get to be able to do all that stuff. So it's so it's a big foot down that haven't taken well. Yeah. And moving them to be ready to go to college, and and we're doing it. It's going okay, but 
the more support we can get at helping them to feel confident academically, the more likely we are going to be able to fill the jobs that we need to care for all of us. <laughs> so but what you also what you also have is this real connection to real life skills. Yes. So it comes alive for them in terms of engagement, which makes it really exciting. They want to learn. Yeah. They do. I mean, so yeah. that's huge. And if they know this math is going to help them succeed, I think they're more likely yeah. to be invested. Okay, so here's our applicants and enrolled students um, from 2019. So you can see, we this is where wow. we changed the you don't have to take biology, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, um, so I think we're collecting a larger pool of people now, um, which I feel really good about. I think it's, it's possible. So I think I know the answer to this. In changing that requirement, do you think you affected the quality of the students, the number of students, or both that are applied? I think we are cap. So that's a really good question. I'm not sure and I hate to describe students a ton of data I on that, but we are definitely getting more applicants. Mm -hmm. um, some of it is that there was a newsletter that went out weekly to school counselors. Like, here's what we do. And I think that made a big difference because people started to be aware, okay, what is this program and who are the strong who are the candidates for it. Um, and then we also removed some of those really intense prerequisites. Mm -hmm. And in the past, they would only accept students who had a certain like grade average. Um, and now it's more looking at, is the student highly interested and are they motivated? Because we know that sometimes students don't do well because they're not happy where they are. It's not that they're not capable, right? And so there's more that goes into that picture so what do you notice then between the students in 1920 uh, 2020 and the students today given what you just said um, there are not as many of them have the skills that they will need when they leave when they get here mm -hmm. there's a little more of a gap that needs to be filled and also, there's a, comp it's comp a confidence thing too, right? A lot of students feel like, okay, I know I want to do this thing over here, but I'm not exactly sure how to get to go there. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the students, um, have a lot of the students don't know how to take tests. And in order to succeed in healthcare, you absolutely have to be able to take a test. And I'll talk about the licensing exams in a minute, but I have students who have scored 30s, 16 out of 100, 22 out of 100 in the first semester, who just didn't pass their licensing exam by two percentage points. That is a huge amount of growth. Even though they didn't pass, right. they went from not being able to take a test right. to almost passing a national test that's written at a level for adults to read. And so we have to kind of keep it in perspective, mm -hmm. too. Yes. You may not know the answer to this, but the students that say, I want to be here, do you think they know that in ninth grade, that they want to be there? And is that something that we say, hey, if you want to be there, in the next two years in your Sunday school, this is what you should be doing? Yeah, I think a lot of students do know what they want to do young. And for some reason, they've gotten the message that they can't do it from it. From, for whatever reason, either from the scores they're getting in school or from messages from other places, they feel like, I, I can't do this, I don't have the skills. Um, and then they, by coming here, they see a path. Oh, I can do this, and then I can do this, and then I can go here. And I do a lot of working with sending school counselors. Unlike this student, they want to do early college, but I think they might need to go back to their sending school to take algebra so that they can be ready for it. So it's a lot of like, what do you want to do and how do we build you the skills so that you can actually get there? Um, so, yeah, it's and where do the students go, um, for example, that complete that, that core, the health professions course? What do they do? The, do they, are they, um, LNAs, are they LPNs, are they RNs, where do they go? Yes, so they get a certified clinical medical assisting license and a certified phlebotomy tech license if they pass the licensing exams. If they don't 
don't pass the licensing exams, Vermont does not require them to have the license to work in the field. So they can still apply and get a job in the field even if they haven't passed the exam. It's obviously ideal if they do, but they don't have to. Some of them will directly go work in the field. Some of them will go to early college and work on the side in the field while they're going to college. And some of them go directly in, like we have a student going to Simmons for physical therapy in Boston next year, she's a senior. And then some of them come back to CVCC for other programs. And then some go back to their studying schools because there's some skills that they need to build before they're ready to do that. And we can't get them there. Like we don't have the coursework here they need to take in order to get into the program they want to get into. Yeah, great question. Um, so this is the family engagement newsletter. They're so small because there's so many. But if you're interested, you can see them. This is a student practicing uh, patient transfers with gate belts. So that's what that picture is. Um, and I just feel really grateful for the kind of close community that this school has because I get to know parents. I see them at parent-teacher conferences. They come in and volunteer to have their blood drawn. Um, one did a career chat today. They read the family newsletters. They respond to my emails. I mean, having engaged parents is such a key to student success, and we really, I feel like, do a great job here at creating that atmosphere. Um, and so, um, yeah, thank you for all you're all doing. Um, so yeah, you just asked this question, what did they do after? So um, we have students who work at Clear Choice MD. They're paying $24 to $26 an hour right now. Central Vermont Medical Center is about $19 to $22. Um, we have a few students that are working in private practices around the area. And what's great about that is those practices do not require them to be 18 or have a high school diploma. And so that can also help. Um, we have students currently in Norwich CCB. BTC, one student just got a job at Margaret Pratt. They're starting in the summer. Um, yeah, so lots of stuff. These are our students in college and our health care. You saw this in our CLNA data, but some of my data did not get entered in correctly, I don't think. And so um, we don't have this year's data yet, but 90% of our students from last year are either enrolled in college or working in the field, which I think is That's great. Here are the different pathways, and so the Red Cross hires students, um, and they'll do training for them as well. Um, the phlebotomy, medical assisting, um, private practices, and early college. And this is a new program that UVM just put out. It's a training program for phlebotomists, and this is a great thing for students who either didn't pass the licensing exam or passed the licensing exam and are not feeling super confident yet to go work right away. And so they can go in, they get a bonus, they get paid training, and then they're put right into a job in the hospital system, which is great. Yeah. Um, here's our program quality data. And so um, last year, 90% of students <coughs> this year is 100%. Last year, 60% passed the CCMA first attempt and 62 the CPT. This year, it was a 58% first attempt and a 25% first attempt for the CPT. So the rates were actually less. The goal was to bring it up 10%. It actually went down. The students who did not pass missed the cutoff by less than two percentage points, which for me was like, no. <laughs> I was, they just demonstrated tremendous growth, but they didn't pass. And so next year, I'm actually not using the curriculum that I used this year. I'm going to use a Harvard publishing curriculum instead to see if that will close the gap, because they are so close. And I'm like, this, there's got to be a way that we can fix this. Um, overall, we're about 23% below the national average for NHA test takers for first attempt to pass rates, which I would really like to see improve. Um, we are working with the high school population versus the adult population. We are working with students who may have significant barriers, and so if, I think our pass rates are good, but I'd like to see them better. We are have almost, actually all the students who didn't pass this year are retaking, which is amazing. They don't always choose to do that, so I'm really hopeful that they'll pass on second attempt and we'll see that data come up. Um, and what does that provide for students if they pass the um, NHA? Yes, yeah, so they get a, they have a license, a 
nationally recognized license they can bring to any state in the United States to work in that, in that field yeah. as a phlebotomy tech or a medical assistant. Yeah. Um, it's much easier to be hired if you have the license, for sure. Um, so but there are some concerns about the certified phlebotomy tech, and I talked to Jody, and I'm hoping to come talk to Program Quality Committee at some point to just get their thoughts on this. Um, we had concerns with volunteers, some of which who have passed out, and so next year we're going to restrict it to just health science students. Um, there's repeated concerns about phlebitis, and so that's just inflammation of the blood vessel, and we're having, like, Joey volunteers a lot, thank you. <laughs> Abby volunteers a lot. We have repeated people volunteering. It's not such a big deal if it's one or two years, but Jody, you know, hopefully will be here for a long time, and so we don't want to blow her veins up. Um, Thank you. So, <laughs> I have some concerns about continuing to draw from the same pool of people over and over again in terms of their own individual health. Um, and so I've been working with CCV, they have a phlebotomy program, and I'm hoping that we can partner with them to get more volunteers so that we're not drawing people as much. <coughs> this part, this program was essentially built out of a request from the hospital, but then the hospital is so understaffed, they're not fully able to support us, and that's been tricky. Um, because it, the first year we did it, we sent students to the hospital and they completed over half their draws there, with me staying back here teaching the students. This year, I had to supervise all of the draws in the lab, mostly by myself. We did a few clinics at the hospital with support, but it, would, it was, I was four and a half weeks behind in my curriculum. I literally just finished teaching yesterday, which I don't like cutting it that close. <laughs> um, but it's just, when I have to do supervise 300 draws, it limits mm -hmm. what else other yeah. stuff I can do. Do we yeah. do anything with those draws with that blood? It goes into biohazard yeah. and is collected. But we can't, we couldn't use it for people that need a test. No, no, no. Yeah, that would be a whole, whole other thing, I guess. Um, it would be nice if we could offer, like the hospitals thought, well, what if we offered free cholesterol screening and right. we get more volunteers? But there's a whole layer of liability that opens up when we start doing that, and so um, that hasn't. We're still trying to get the gift cards to the cafeteria, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so also there is an equity issue with the CPT because not all students have access to friends and family who can come in and volunteer. And so that's been tricky. I've had students who have flown through their 30 draws because they just have an abundance of people they can ask, and students who don't have, fam have family who work and are just not able to come in. And so that has been challenging, and then I end up working really hard to recruit people for those students, but I can't always recruit everyone, and so that's a concern I have. Um, and, and usually the there's a bruise, so I can't, uh -huh. I have to wait a week right. before I can uh -huh. go back in. Yeah. Yeah. So there can be bruising. <laughs> yep. um, so CVMC really wants us to keep the CPT, and so I'm motivated to, to continue to think creatively around how to make this work. Um, but at the moment, if we don't have some sort of collaboration with the hospital or CCV, we're pretty limited in how much more we can do than what we're already doing. In terms of the uh, program quality standards for the AOE, with our six college credits, we're meeting program quality. Um, whoever passes the license test is like icing on the cake in terms of program quality. and. I would like to see those students who are missing it by 2% get the credential. Can, really quickly, can I ask the, you mentioned that it was a, that the hospital is partnering with us for that. What are, what are, what's the hospital providing yeah, so, to incentivize? Um, we're very lucky that we had the lab director's daughter in the program two years ago, so that was actually really lucky. Um, so he's very invested in the program. Mm -hmm. They give us all their expired materials, which is a huge amount of money, like thousands and thousands of dollars of materials they donate to us, expired tubes, expired needles that we use on trainers, not on people. Um, and then they're giving us space, and they're helping us recruit volunteers. And so that's what they're doing this year. 
last year, their director, their lab director and lab manager actually supervised students mm -hmm. doing draws, mm -hmm. which made it much easier for me because I could have them do 10 with me and then send them to the hospital for the rest of them. Um, but they don't necessarily always have capacity to do that. They're understaffed as it is. I'm hopeful for next year because it sounds like they might be fully staffed, fingers crossed. And so I'm hoping that we might be able to do a similar thing that we, as we did two years ago. Is there too much liability for us to, let's say, work with the Red Cross when they go to the Elks Club? Is it, is it all about yeah. liability? So the Red Cross requires you to be 18. Oh. And this is the other tricky part. Because, so I, we worked with HR at the hospital, mm -hmm. to, and they had to check with legal, and we had to check with legal, and it was this whole thing, to, to adjust the age so that students didn't have to be 18 to work in the lab. Currently, a phlebotomy tech is the only position in the entire UVM network that you do not have to be 18 to do. And if they hadn't changed that credential, we would not be doing what we're doing right now. Bravo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> deep, deep, deep. Um, okay, so for future, our program goals are to continue to recruit non-traditional students. Um, that's a need that we still have for Perkins 5. Um, we'd love to make a video, but we just haven't had the time to do it yet. Um, working on those four areas of core academics that the students need to meet with the Program Quality Committee um, to kind of discuss the CPT and think creatively about that. And then switching human biology and intro to healthcare to A and P one and two through BTC. Yeah. So those are our goals. I just gave you the same amount of information. I apologize. <laughs> Thank you. That was great. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Do you foresee switching to A and P as being an impediment to some students? So that's a really good question. Um, I wouldn't have. With our new admissions process, I would say that I could have done it this year. I could have done AP one and two this year. Um, I, I'm going to have to let go of some other stuff in order to fit it in, but I think it's doable. And the students, in an ideal situation, we would have like an expo tech, the health science expo tech. Then we'd have a year one for 11th graders, and we'd have a year two for 12th graders, and they would either take A and B one in 11th grade and A and B two in 12th grade, or both A and B one and two in 12th grade. And we're working towards that, and this is part of that process. I don't think it's an ideal situation to do the CCMA, the CPT, A B one and two, and all the other stuff with one teacher in one year. We're actually the only program in the state that has both the CPT and the CCMA in a one year program. And so, yes, it's much too ambitious. <laughs> could, we, could we consider that being two different programs since we don't allow somebody to take the same program twice? I mean, if we, well, we've got, what do we have, ENP one and two, right? Yeah, right. yeah. in an ideal world, we'd have, a, you know, they, they come here in their sophomore year, they do expo tech, they take English composition, they would take nutrition, they would take communication as fast forward, then they go to 11th grade, they might do one of those two credentials with more college coursework, and then they move to 12th grade to do the other one. And I they, think that would be an ideal situation, but we're not there yet. What would they, if you did that, they could at least get something by 11th grade if they decided to go back to their senior school for their senior year. Right. It's not like a wasted year, they yeah. could actually got one of the two credentials. Yeah, and, the, and the doing phlebotomy is part of the scope of practice for medical. So even if someone doesn't pass the CPT, they can still work as a phlebotomist mm -hmm. with the CCMA credential. It's not ideal, but they can do it. Mm -hmm. Really good questions. Yeah, I think Burlington Tech had four do the CPT this year, and Essex Tech pass rates weren't quite as strong as ours, and so we're not, we're kind of right at the level mm -hmm. of everybody else, but I would still like to see yeah. it. Well, thank you very thank much. You we really sorry. appreciate so everything, and it I sounds like an exciting program. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having me. Yes, thank, thank you. I'm going to go home and put my kids in bed. Yes. <laughs> Me too. Okay. Now, where is, is he on?
Yes. He's online. Okay. Alrighty. I think with the board's permission, we're going to skip ahead a little bit. We can go back and, and review uh, committee reports, but we need to move ahead to project update because we have our representative online and um, we can uh, deal with. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Great. Well, that was a tough act to follow. <laughs> But I'll, I'll do my best. Um, Jody, should I share the slide deck or can you share it? Well, how do you want to do that? Either way, whatever's easiest for you. I'll try sharing it. We'll see how that goes. Okay. Uh, share screen. It's the exciting part. Yeah. Well, that was just fabulous. Yes. She's great. Oh. Dr. Jocelyn, that's awesome. Yeah. Can you see that okay? Yeah. Great. Well, so um, thank you for having us. Um, we're excited to share with you where we are with the project. Um, we've been all working hard, Jody especially, um, as well as the engineers and the lab designers to try and bring this project forward. Um, so what we want to do tonight is give you an update on where we're at and uh, so that we can hopefully move forward with the next steps. And that's, um, so we'll talk about the presentation goal. Um, then we'll talk about the visioning work, the programming work about what, where the project's headed in terms of what does it include? How big is it? How much might, might it cost? Then we'll also update you on the site selection process. And, um, and talk about next steps. Jody, do you have anything you want to add to kick us off? No, I think I alluded to this in our retreat earlier that we have some big talking points when it comes to site selection. So I think we're all ready for your presentation. Okay. Great. So um, just to reiterate, the, the, the goal is to update the board on project scope and you know, if if the board feels good about where we're headed to get approval to move forward with the site selection process, because the next step would be to start contacting landowners. We have a list we'll go through of potential sites. And, you know, once you start contacting, land, contacting land, landowners, then the project gets a little more real and, you know, may hit the press. And uh, we just want to make sure the board is is on, on the board is on board with that before we do that. Um, but first, we want to talk about the um, the project vision. Uh, this is the vision statement for the project, um, which Jody crafted and and was I, th I believe endorsed. Um, you know, expanding capacity, meeting um, meeting the demand of you know all students that want to do this increased academic achievement pathways to advance career credentials and strengthening partnerships with middle schools so that expanded capacity and and creating that state-of-the-art facility has certain ramifications in terms of size um, so the the project the plan right now we've we've met with all of the stakeholder groups we um, from the 2020 and 2021 work we had diagrams of every lab space so we we've met with each group we've updated those um, updated so, somebody's microphone is is uh, quite noisy yeah I think it's just the um, oh so the, is it the air in your room? So I can mute, but that means if anyone in the room wants to speak, let me know. Okay. Sorry about that. It's, it's distracting. Um, so we've met with all these groups. Um, we've updated the, the diagrams. Um, they're not completely updated. And you'll see in this list of uh, programs, there are some that are um, used to be part of CVCC and now the idea is to bring them back and some of them are new. So this is, and they're grouped in four uh, career clusters. This is the STEM group. Then we have 
the Health and Natural Sciences group. And you can see a couple of these programs were here, like Human Services and Natural Resources, and now they want to bring them back. But then Animal Science would be a new program. Mm -hmm. Did you move your, your slideshow, David? Because we're only seeing STEM right now. Oh, it's not updating? Nope. Not advancing. Oh, well, that's weird. Let me um, let me reshare it. Stop presenting. Three percent. Okay. So, do you see this? You see STEM now. Um, works now okay so um, this was the health and natural sciences I mentioned that human services and natural resources are returning um, the plan is to bring them back animal science is a new program can you see arts and design now okay um, currently, digital media uh, arts one and two exist. Advanced manufacturing would new, and design and fabrication exists, but it's off site. So the idea would be to bring it on site. Um, culinary arts and baking arts exist. Um, business and information technology would be a new program, and then the you can see the. There is a small, and, and so some of these programs do exist, and they're very small, like explore, the exploratory program. Um, and then the pre-tech foundations would be new. Um, when you put all this into the mix, you know, what we're looking at is a, a building that holds a maximum of about 500 students. It's a full day program. It's about 150,000 square feet of space. It's a substantial building, and the projected cost, and this is, this is just back of the napkin, um, you know, kind of a, a very crude calculation, is around $150 million project. So it's a, it's a big project, um, big building, an expensive project, um, and, you know, potentially harvesting quite a few students from the sending towns, which is is causing a lot of, I think, consternation among superintendents uh, in the area. But so that's that's like the that's the kind of the big picture. I'm going I mean, this is very thirty thousand feet, but just to give you a sense of scale of the project. Any questions um, on that so far? David, we talked earlier about just declining enrollment and kind of not in specific terms, but what we're seeing at our sending schools for folks who represent those boards. And then it relates to what happened when we were talking in the committee meeting last week about what happens when you take 500 students, which is doubling our capacity now from our sending schools. What impact does that have right. on top of early college and other things that are already happening. So it's in everyone's brain, I think. To okay. Be okay, good. So if there's no other questions or comments about the general scope and size of the project, and, and currently, you know, there are two models that we're looking at. One is a standalone facility on a greenfield site. And the other is, you'll see when we get to site selection, is looking at the possibility of co-locating it on the U32 site, um, which has other, um, you know, there, there could be some shared resources in a scenario like that. But we don't think that there it's a significant um, 
savings in terms of it's not like half the price, half the cost. It's not even 75% of the cost. It might be 10 million or 15 million cheaper, which is real money. But I don't want people to think, oh, if we co-locate on U32, you know, we'll cut the price and the cost in half. Um, and similarly, if we reduce the number of students, um, when, when we, you know, so many of these programs are, um, have a, a cohort in the morning and a cohort in the afternoon um, that use the lab. So we're getting more utilization out of the space. If with less students, the building could get smaller in some ways, but not, it's not linear. I guess what I'm saying. It's like if you said, well, we really should only build a school for 250, would it be a smaller building? Yes, probably, but not half the, the size. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So um, on a parallel track to the, the visioning and programming work, has been the select the site selection process, which has been pretty fascinating. Um, we set um, a search area, which is the central towns of the sending schools. I, if you could, and that's the hatched area on um, this map. And so that would be Barry, Barrytown, Berlin, East Montpelier, Moortown, and Middlesex. But we really focused more in the Barry, uh, Barry town, Berlin, and East Montpelier. So originally what we said was, well, we'll go with 20 acres minimum. We'll do, if municipal sewer is nearby, um, you know, within a quarter of a mile, that's close enough. What, and, and so what our engineers do is they use GIS, which is a, a geographic information system, they do a query and they come back with, um, can you see this slide now, this um, colorful map? Yeah, so they came back with um, 193 sites and we were like, oh boy, what, well, you know, an embarrassment of riches. So you can see all of these sites met that criteria so then we said, well, why don't we tighten up the criteria? So we tightened up the criteria um, to be a little, we said, must be, um, have municipal water nearby, must have uh, municipal sewer, uh, well, we said sewer, municipal water nearby, paved road, and um, 20 acres of buildable area, not just 20 acres, right? So they did that analysis and it dropped down to 33 sites. So there was a, a sigh of relief. Um, and then we said, okay, we, we noticed that of the 33 sites, there were um, 16 sites, here's the 33 sites. Um, 16 of the sites were on a paved road, were had municipal water, had three-phase power. Um, we didn't need to say that we needed to find sites that it was nearby. So that dropped it down to 16 sites. Then uh, EV, which is Engineering Ventures, looked at and they recommended the top 10 sites and, and met with the facilities committee. And this was last week. And then the facility committee, we looked at one final criteria, which was the proportions of the site, because sometimes you could meet all of these criteria, but have like a long skinny site, which would be difficult to develop. So the last criteria was that it had reasonable proportions that were, uh, you know, sort of a fat rectangle ish. And um, out of that came seven sites. And so I'll, we'll, I'll show you the diagrams for each site. Um, First is the map of the top seven sites. So you can see at the top, you have um, the U32 site. David, um, it's yes. not moving again. So we're still seeing the 193 sites map. Okay, let me, let me stop presenting. 
and I'll re present and we'll do this again. Okay, so you saw the 193. All right, we'll take you right back to where we were. Apologies, I don't know why I'm, this is a four game. Are you seeing the slideshow or is it no. blurry? Is it full screen? <laughs> it was blurry. Yeah, that's good. What's that? You're good. Okay, we'll try that. Um, so this is the this shows the seven top sites, and then there's a diagram for each one. And this is what we look at. Um, this is how the engineers work. Is that, um, for example, this is the Gallison Hill Road site, and um, which is East Montpelier, U32 rather. So on the left, you can see um, the U32 site. And then there's a piece of property, 212 acres right next to it. The, um, what happens is that the um, green and gray are low slopes. The red and orange are steep slopes. So what they've done is they've identified buildable areas on the sites through the colors. We also look at wetlands. You can see there's a class two wetland on the right side here, existing streams. Um, so, so we're looking for a variety of, um, and you can see the sewer service area here on the left. So I'm, I'm going into a little bit more detail on this one. I won't go into so many details on the other ones, but this is the, the kind of analysis that's done to make sure that it meets all of the criteria. So this is, um, the next site is Airport Road in Berlin. This is a quite a large site. This is a 590 acre site, which obviously we don't need. We think we need about 20 acres of buildable area. And part of that has to do with, um, you know, the building, the parking, um, the outdoor spaces. If this school ever becomes a degree granting high school, and it needs to provide sports fields or playing fields or recreation fields, then we want to make sure we have enough room for those things. This this site is quite large, um, right behind the airport. The, um, the next slide, the next one is in um, on Chartrand Lane in Berlin. And you can see how like there's a wetland on the top right there's the, the red colors, which indicate the steep slopes. And so the buildable areas, um, this, this is 12.4, and this is a bigger one here. So on and so forth. So this is Payne Turnpike. Um, this is the behind the mall, um, the Berlin Mall. There's quite a large site here uh, that's developable. 23.5 acres uh, or 14.7, but the total site is larger. Um, this is Bolster Road in Barry, uh, Barrytown. I think this is up by the um, Wilson Industrial Park. The Barrytown owns an 87 acre parcel here. There's actually some other parcels here as well. Um, and then six and seven are two parcels also owned by the town of Barry on Pittman Road. This is this one is actually this is the one near Wilson Industrial Park. So this is the, the nature of the sites. We started with 193, we kept narrowing it down. You know, and the reasoning for uh, water having being on well, first of all, three-phase power, you need it for all your equipment. There's a lot of equipment that uses that kind of power. Um, and in terms of the septic and sewer, you know, those are, um, while it's not impossible to build a school, you know, a lot of rural schools have on-site septic um, and on-site wells, but they're a maintenance issue. And 
given the plethora of sites that were available and the number of sites that were on uh, municipal water and sewer, we thought that was a much better option um, as well as the paved road for a school of this nature because schools are in the business of, of educating students, not in the business of managing septic systems and, uh, and wells. So, um, so that is the, that is the, those are the final seven. Um, and so in terms of next steps, we have to um, finalize the, the, the space program, which is 99.9% .9 finalized, um, update the prototype diagrams, um, including there are some new, the, the, the diagrams for the spaces that didn't exist um, in 2020. Um, that's as far as visioning goes and programming. And then for site selection, um, contacting the landowners, finding out which sites might be for, you know, they would consider selling. And then once we have two or three sites, um, we need to do what's called a site feasibility study. We need to do a basic layout of the, of the building on the site, see if it works with access roads, with um, the exterior spaces, with parking. Um, we may need to do some uh, analysis of, uh, because these maps of the wetlands are very, um, you know, they're done with, with um, you know, flyover mapping. So we need to have a wetlands biologist go and walk the site and determine where the wetlands, where they are. There's a whole series of things to make sure that, you know, if you're embarking on a land purchase, moving towards developing this property that, you know, the, the proper due diligence is completed. I assume we have to do some Act 250 stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, well, our, our civil engineer would do a, a permit review to make sure um, you know, to determine what permits either exist on the site or what permits would we would need to get um, to develop the site. Sometimes, too, you know, with these properties, there's not very good boundary surveys. And so on certain, pro sometimes on properties, we have to get boundary surveys. And even if there's tricky topography, you might have to have a survey done of the topography. Um, it, so it, it, it'll just depend on what site, what what available, what information is available on the sites that um, rise to the top. That, that was my question. What would be the impact of Act 250? Exactly. Yeah, I think that would, that's part of the, the due diligence is to review all of that. It's my understanding that there's significant changes in the offing with that, and I don't know whether in the next couple of years that would impact this or not. Yeah, well, and that's, you know, our, our civil engineers will, will advise us on, on that. And, and, you know, once one of the things with Act 250 and the district offices is that they don't really like to talk you about what ifs but if you come to them with a proposal you say like we're considering this site we've done all of our homework here's how it would lay out then if they have something to react to they'll work with you and sit down and say well you're going to need to get these permits and this is the timeline and you know um, you should be concerned about this or that or the other but until you have something to propose to them they're very reluctant to talk about what ifs Plus, David, isn't that part of the uh, your back of na napkin, uh, you know, early estimate costs? I mean, that, doesn't that include permit permitting and stuff like that? No, the the the, the back of a napkin is really um, just taking the size of the building, using the square foot costs, and and putting a number in for site development, and then a percentage for you know, equipment and, and, you know, 
permits and you know it's just a really it's like a, 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 a little cost calculator with a lot of assumptions so one of the things about the site selection phase that we're in is we would do these feasibility analysis and once we have actual like site plans uh, that show the extent of parking and the extent of earthwork and the building um, then we have a cost estimator that's part of our team who would give uh, provide a cost estimate for it could be one site it could be three sites um, and this will that'll be the first time that the we'll all have like a, a number that is based on a design um, now it's it's not the it's not the design you would take for a bond vote um, but it would be at least the first kind of gut check about okay here's where this project's heading you know given um, these specific sites and the specific size of building that and, and what goes in it once you have you know a site and that gets green lighted and you come up with an arrangement with the landowner then we would proceed to what's called concept design which is the next stage where we would actually develop the design of the building sufficient to go to a bond vote Any other questions or concerns from the board? Well, I'm just wondering how much time we have so that we can move forward. You know, when do we need to finalize a site? Um, our our schedule uh, has the um, site selection being completed by in September, um, and then. Um, then we would go into concept design then if, if, if all went well. But to stay on that track, David, you, we need permission for me to reach out to those landlord owners from this meeting, right? That's correct. Yeah, to stay on track, we need to proceed with contacting the landowners. And that's really because that seemed like a significant step. We wanted to reach out, you know, update the board and, and get um, that approval to do that so um, so that everybody is you know on the same page so um, yeah, I know there's been some discussion about declining enrollments in all of our sending districts um, and I believe does it we don't have a wash central representative do we? Okay. so <laughs> did did your district just go through a facilities um, visioning process or they're something? Going, they did. They're, they're, they're going through that. They still haven't made decisions on, uh -huh. but they have several models. Uh -huh. And um, the principal of that school and the school board chair were both at last week's meeting. Uh -huh. And I would say that the discussion in the room between the principal and I was the impact on U32 and the thought of the impact on all of our sending schools if we were to build a size of school that takes 500 students what that would be and whether or not there needs to be a broader discussion between all of our sending schools about a central vermont high school because um, what did get brought in in that room is that montpelier has also worked with truex cullens yes, i believe mm -hmm. and has a possible project but also has also said maybe we step back and reconsider working with a neighbor and so I think that I think when we look at it we have that visioning piece on the agenda tonight mm -hmm. to approve is that accurate anymore do we keep moving forward at this pace do we reset our timeline do we slow our roll to get the opportunity to talk with all of our sending schools and and think about that idea or do we keep moving forward and have those discussions that's that's kind of the dilemma that I think we have knowing that many of you sit on other boards mm -hmm. and you have to be thinking about both and floor's argument was we need to keep moving because students are we're turning away students and so if we slow down that Floor's means we the, chair of the washington, washington central um and she used to be on this board too okay. and if we 
if we slow our roll too much, that means more and more students don't get access to the education they want. Mm -hmm. So thinking of all those things. Well, I agree with that in terms of Floor's sentiment that we want that. But in terms of transparency with our partners, it seems that we have an obligation to be really upfront and have that conversation now. Mm -hmm. Especially in lieu of the budget votes. I mean, it's a palpable time. Everybody's feeling stung <coughs> by budgets not passing. And it seems if we're talking about a Central Vermont High School, this is a time to consolidate and collaborate, it just seems, and to be as I said, transparent and understand what where everyone's coming from because all of our towns have to support this. Mm -hmm. And that's that's where the co-location model, that's why it's still there mm -hmm. because that makes sense in that context. Yeah. I think there was a sense too that by by continuing this process it puts uh, it it not that it, not we want to put pressure, but you know the the U thirty two co location and the whole Montpelier U thirty conversation could take years and years and years and years. And if there was a feeling that if if this project was proceeding forward, it might provide some urgency to that discussion, so as that opportunity would not be lost. And I don't know if that's that's true or not, but that was a, a sentiment discussed. Guy. Yeah, the, the, the piece that I, was it the principal that he stated, you know, once doing the, some minor calculations, probably on the back of a napkin, but probably fairly accurate, was that if this building is built, it could be the biggest high school in the area, which would force, you know, discussions or, you know, probably the same thing he was just saying. That was kind of an eye opener. You know, I didn't realize, you know, how much, you know, we would draw off from other schools. You know, I mean, all we need to do is draw eleven more kids out of Canada, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> Lyman, question. Um, are we discussing sites and ideas tonight, or no? Those sites are there. The only thing that I think we were looking for was, do you want me to start reaching out to landowners? So I got. I got two things. Um, yeah. The first is the co-location idea. I just like to put out there that that's kind of what we're dealing with now. And will we have the exact same thing just with U32 that we have with, with Spalding? Where even if it's not the huh. that we're actually together, the perception is now that it's East Montpelier's school, not Barry's mm -hmm. school. Um, which is one of the things that I have an issue with with that, but something to come up. Um, the second thing is with the progression, you want for September to be when we can start doing concepts on the site. Does that mean that we have to commit to a landowner to buy the site? I mean, or else they're going to design a building for a site that we don't even know will still be for sale when it comes time to buy it. Mm -hmm. Do we have to commit like that or no? Normally you would commit and put money down. Okay. And we would go to bond vote. If it passes, we get it. If we if it fails, we lose the money. Okay. And is that a percentage so, of the purchase price? Yeah, usually. Purchase price. Yeah. So here's it's my concern older. if we don't move forward. Is we have seven sites that we could potentially get told no on yes. on every single one of them, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. So what does it hurt if we just start that conversation? Um, and then we can sort of step back and say, if there's no options, then you know it's a different discussion. If there's options, then at that point we say, what do we do, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I, I we could have the landowner sign an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement. Um, if you don't want it to be public, if you want to kind of keep it quiet, you could you could say we want to talk to you, but we about your land, but we need. I mean, 
This is an open meeting that is yeah. on Orca, so it's public already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I know, but 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 at purchases. There's certain things that are, you know fall under executive, you know, session. And I don't know if that if you know negotiating, let's say a contract would fall under that category and this would be negotiating a contract in some ways so anyway i'm just offering that as an option if people felt that was you know the public nature of the um consideration you know was was a deal breaker so specifically what do you need from the board at this time well uh just a motion to approve um, for the director to reach out to the landowner, um, the land, the land, you know, to start reaching out to landowners. The, the, from the seven sites that. Well, I, I, I think it could be a little broader because if, if, for example, Jody calls all seven and they all say no, we have eight, nine, and ten. Then we have 192, so, you know. <laughs> so I think it would be, it, it, would, uh, it would be good if it was just a general, you know, permission to reach out. And then if, if we get to seven and she has to call eight and nine, then she doesn't have to come back to the board. That's a good point. Okay. So I'll move to uh, grant permission to Jody Emerson superintendent to reach out to the landowners um, about a possible set. I second that and motion. <laughs> <laughs> Any discussion? Any questions? I guess my I do have a discussion point. Sure. So we're not hiding this from anyone. We're not doing an NDA or any of that. No. We're just reaching out and it's public. I seconded it. Okay. Question, My sir? guess is if, if there were landowners that were open to it, then we could have discussions with them in executive session. Mm -hmm. But I'm just reaching out to see if they're even open to yeah. possible. a possible sale. Right. Right. Just. And given the nature of the conversation, at what point do we have a maybe a simultaneous or parallel conversation yeah. with the supers yeah. yes about consolidation yeah well, absolutely just about ideas which may include some degree of consolidation yeah. depending on the needs of however it goes to have a conversation now yeah, yeah. who's having that conversation yeah. sorry it's kind of a separate question yeah. to the yeah. one that was motion but related well it would be Joni Jody. With all the supers, is that no. how it would go? I honestly no, think it needs to be done no. with the boards because we presented right. to the supers and that was not the direction it took. So um, all the board members together I think in the, a big room? I think right now it needs to start with our individual appointed members going back to their boards and sharing, here's where we're at and here's an idea that came up. The idea of Central Vermont High School? Sure. Any and all of it. Yeah. <laughs> the, the thought process around that is if any of our high schools, oh, sorry, no. you don't count, <laughs> <laughs> drop that, that have more than 300 students, drop below 300 students, it doesn't cost you less to operate your school because you have less students mm -hmm. at that point, mm -hmm. especially if you want them to have the same level of options. Mm -hmm. But once you drop below that number, the, you limit your options, right? Mm -hmm. if, especially if you need to so cut costs. So 300 is the cut point. Like, let's just use that just variable, use right. right? So let's do this. And so most of them nice. would. Yep. What? And most of them would drop under yep. at that point. Okay. Let's work on this motion, the motion to allow the director to approach the landowners to see if they're open to a potential sale. Let's, let's vote on that, and then we can have the discussion about how to approach the boards of our sending schools okay. all right so all those in favor of this motion aye. Aye. aye anyone opposed 
Hearing none, motion carries. So we have authorized um, Director Emerson, Superintendent Emerson, to approach the owners of the top seven uh, sites. No, 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 to any site, mm -hmm. any, any number of sites. So she doesn't have to come so back. So she doesn't have to come back to us. That's what the conversation we just okay, had. Okay, so any yeah. any number of sites. I promise but, to start with but those. start with the, start with the top start with the top seven. I'm thinking 193. <laughs> yes, but anyhow, so we'll start with the top seven. Go forward from there and report back to us on what the options are for land. Right. All right. Sorry. Now I will ask the question that I yes. Didn't ask. Okay. Yes. Okay. But I don't remember. Said, so well, <laughs> how do we how do we deal <laughs> with the 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 school boards and the superintendents in our sending districts to tell them that we have made this this move mm -hmm. to move forward with actually looking for land? Because if you're looking for land, the next step is the building. Right. So we're go we we are moving forward as a as a district. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we keep those folks in the loop so that they're not suddenly um, blindsided. Yes, blindsided or angry with us or um, surprised at the whole situation. Well, we may miss an opportunity. Yes. Yeah. That was framed in a lovely way. Thank yes. <laughs> so. Notice he doesn't have to go to that meeting. I'm new to this board. I'm relatively new to that board. Do, is it a practice where like this board might send a letter to the chair of the all of the sending board so that there's a consistent message yes, out yes. to everybody that's an excellent I point. would like that yeah and then maybe th that it then that's would the be followed by a conversation within each individual board well I have a board meeting tomorrow night and jump on it that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. I was thinking that we could, I could put together the, the vision statement, which is also on our agenda for tonight to approve, and um, just a little piece about where we are in the process and moving forward and share that with you. And mm -hmm. I can actually send it to the superintendents as well and recommend that this be a conversation sooner than later, um, that we recognize the, the environment we're in and we we would rather be collaborating on this early. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And here's just a question for the board. Do you folks all give a report to your board about this this board? No. Okay. Occasionally. Okay. I mean, now and again, oh, which depends on what's happening. Okay, because if we all use the same talking points mm -hmm. as a presentation and could hand that to fellow board members, to the board chair, the superintendent of our law, they would all have the same talking points as as everyone else and there wouldn't be any question of um, you know did did Macy's tell Gimbel's did did the Career Center tell um, Gimbel's doesn't exist anymore. I know I know but um, it's, an, it's an old saying I know. <laughs> for us old people I know. <laughs> but anyhow, but but that's the kind of thing so that everybody hears the same yeah. words at the at the relatively same time. I, I would also add that you could repurpose the presentation we just gave, parts of it, um, for the purposes of communicating with others. And you know, I would offer that if if you wanted a a, a present, you know, the similar presentation to a joint group you know on zoom or something like that we could provide that as well if that would be helpful i think that would be from from sitting on two boards sitting on this board and sitting on my local school board um shorter is better mm -hmm. and then after you we get through the short part then we can offer the long the long points but we need to yeah, get, yeah. we need to get something out to the boards um, pretty quickly since this is public that we need to communicate with them that this is now in the works and everybody needs to have the same um, page in the in the hymnal so that we're yeah. all set the timing is rough yep. David because everybody no boards usually meet in July right right so you have to get it out mm -hmm. this month yeah yeah and we might have already missed a board who knows right 
even if it's not warned on their meetings, they can't talk so about it anymore. So what would be beneficial? Yeah, I'm most thinking, of them have a CBCC. Would be to you know talk about that we have all these sites that we want to investigate. I don't know. We have 193 sites. Yeah, but I think what we're saying is we are now in the process of investigating potential sites. Right. Right. We don't have to name them. No, I um, just was thinking about like these three or four pages might be good to just copy and share. You know, when we talk about that it would be for 500 students or to even say something that when the population goes below 300, it's not viable for educational opportunity for students to advance as they would like, that we want to explore the opportunity and options for a new career center, and we've been investigating site locations, and we're going ahead. Rather than okay. the 300 number, I think we would want to say just that we're concerned about the impact. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. How about this? How about Jody and I put something together, share it with you guys? Um, I have a board meeting tomorrow. Okay, we'll get it, we'll get it to you. As soon as around that press conference, <laughs> yes, I'll be at, I'll be at the back. <laughs> yeah, no, but anyhow, um, we'll we'll do that. So we'll get that out to everybody sooner rather than later, and then get the ball rolling for what a more detailed uh, presentation might look like. Does that okay. yeah. solve good. everybody's needs? Yeah. Okay, very good. All right. Great. Um, I'm if that if you have. You're all done with me. I will say good night. Um, good night. Okay. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. All right. We have progress here. All right. We have to just head back a little bit to um, committee reports, finance. Anything from finance? Not we yet. were unable to meet. <laughs> okay. Um, so Michelle's going to share what she would have shared about the Vermont Child Care contribution. Okay. And with I, all of you. I feel like we saw, I talked about this last time. Did I? Or no? Okay. I'm going to two different ones. So, yeah, the new child care contribution tax rate. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it becomes effective July 1st. There's a percentage um, that we have to pay. It should go into, if you would like to, you can bring it up to negotiations for next year because an employee can contribute uh, up to 0.11%. It does look like for next year, since it wasn't negotiated, we are responsible for the full amount, which is 0.44%, and I have that estimated between 10 and $15,000. That's for everyone? Yep, everyone. Yep. Um, what else? Out. Accounts payable for May. I didn't have anything. Is there any questions about? Accounts payable. We're done purchasing for the year. Finishing up. We did get our audit, which I shared with you all. Unfortunately, we don't have another meeting until August, but feel free to read it and reach out to me. Um, there are no reports, but no findings, no recommendations. Yay! Uh, we did. We did a lot of work this year, working with the auditing team to uh, reestablish some procedures that needed to be updated from the first year we were from the year being audited so we've moved forward and it's amazing we're already halfway maybe not halfway but pretty close halfway to our FY24 audit being complete as well so when do you send money back to schools uh... yeah so in my highlights you notice we had more revenue FY23 and less expenses so it did create a fund balance and I have to submit all the expenditures and all the revenues to the state, and then they tell me what our actual allowable tuition is. Our allowable tuition was lower than what we announced our tuition at, so we have to give our sending schools, either we can give them, write them out a check, or we can give them a credit on their tuition. I reached out to our two largest sending school districts. I verified with the AOE. Um, it was up to my discretion with the district's discretion. I reached out to our two send largest sending school districts and we're giving them a credit to be issued for July. So it'll be for FY26, but we're not actually physically giving them money back that we have a credit. Um, I hope that helps. FY25, right? It's, yeah, yes. FY25. Yes. I'm 
more it's than okay. three years here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So do we, we have a fund balance number yet? We do have a fund balance that was that was shared. Um, I want to say it's right around three hundred thousand dollars for that for last year. Um, we also had a fund balance that was carried over from when we were part of BUSD, which was around two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That's going to be all an uncommitted fund balance, meaning that it's spendable. 550k. Yeah, Kali. Is there a Sorry. The majority of it is going into a the renovation yeah. project yeah. that yeah. We, we approved <laughs> last month. Right. So <laughs> the two projects that are already in the works, which is uh, this building project and the right. renovation project, we're going to need to pay those first and see what we have left. I mean the welding project? The welding yeah. project. Yeah. Yeah, commonly and commonly known as the world in Trix Collins yes. and Trix right. Collins, yeah, the yes. Valley Brent Singer. Yeah, yes. so yeah, those pretty big projects. Yeah. Okay. okay, everyone, any more questions? All right, program quality. Do we have anything to report from pro program quality? We didn't meet. Didn't meet. Okay, the, the, the retreat meet. took your time. Yes, okay, very good. Mm -hmm. Superintendent report. Um, I shared with you some of the assessments that happened most recently last week from our courses and programs um, around those industry recognized credentials. The fact that um, we have the governor coming tomorrow to do a press conference at 11 a.m. for the mobile home project and you know, where we are with that. We have in here a draft for the bid for the mobile home, which will be sold as is. It's not going to be completed, unfortunately. Um, students have one more day to work on it, and it's just not going to get done. Um, and I'm, although I'm tempted to ask my staff to just like let's go out there and see what we can do next week during professional development I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure that's really the, the right next step <laughs> it's fun to think about though um, we did sign that agreement with EEI for the renovation of the welding space and um, held a kickoff meeting and then also met with their designers who are working on the sketches for um, they have to get permits I should know those because we've gotten a lot recently <coughs> Um, they're also going to get us a, an amount for the space that the maintenance shop moved to um, for the electrical cost there um, because there has been an ask that we pay for that since we asked them to move. So we'll, we'll talk about that in the future. We got to induct 15 students into the National Technical Honor Society on May 23rd. It was great. If you weren't there, hopefully you got to see the video or at least see some of the photos that went out. You can click through those. Um, they're attached to our newsletter that went out today. And we have our Skills USA Gold winners are heading to Atlanta on um, June 24th. And so we wish them luck when they go there. And then we get to kick off the new year with six of our employees going to Nashville uh, for the SREB Making Schools Work Conference. Excellent. And I will be presenting at that conference as yeah. well. Okay. All right. So, um, next on our list is the um, approval of the bid process, right? No. C14. Uh, policy C14, C C the 504. The um, grievance thing. protocol? Yep. Yep. You've got all the signatures? Mm -hmm. I got that's something. Not I had that's, that's not, not this. Yep. This was just. This oh, was no, first read on May 13. This is the second reading. Is there anyone who has read it and has any questions or concerns about um, codes uh, policy code C14 regarding Section 504 and the ADA grievance protocol for students and staff? Hearing none. Um, we need a motion to approve um, policy code C14, section 14, and Americans with Disability Act grievance protocol for students and staff policy. Do I have a, a motion? So moved. Okay. So moved. I need a second. Okay. Guy, we have a second. Um, any discussion? Who, was, who, uh, who moved the motion? Scott. 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 Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. Sky second. Any discussion? All right. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? 
Hearing none, motion carried. C-14 is adopted. Great. Today is 6, what is it? 610-2024. All right, very good. All right, now we have the revenue anticipation note which is pretty common practice. Nope, we have no. a vision statement first. Oh, vision statement. I'll get there. I can read. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Let's see. You have to turn the page. Okay, the vision statement um, for our... It's on the top. Yes. There it is. Okay, vision sta statement. There it is. All right. <laughs> This is for our current and new building, or just it's for the new building. New building. Okay. Yeah. Do we have any questions or concerns about this? So I do. Okay. <laughs> Looking at that second bullet, does a co-location change that at all, or is it? variable enough that it works. A full day program? So the increased that? academic achievement? The increased academic achievement through full day programming and a full school day schedule. I think, I think it's I think it's vague enough, but I think it would stand regardless of whether it was co located yeah. or whether it was sta a standalone Perfect. building. Thank yeah. you. Because it would still be a full day programming in the yep. state of an art. Yep. High school. So would yep. the idea of a co-located building be that the academic portion would be done by U32 teachers? Could be shared, yeah. Could. Okay. And, and, and in that brainstorm, it's not U32. It's Central Vermont High School. So U32 doesn't exist as U32 then if it's Central Vermont. They become Central Vermont High School. So that's, we all become Central Vermont. That's, we two, all that's yeah. two different. Yeah, and so there's two uh, possibilities in that, right? It could be that U32 teachers do that and we share a library, auditorium, and cafeteria, although the cafeteria would be, need to be enlarged. Or it's a bigger project that is a collaboration between many districts. Right. So, and there's no world in which it's just buying that piece of property that happens to be next door to U32. And, and we're going forward. It, it as could it be. Big enough. And yeah. we use the sewer and the water. Well, I mean, and it's the far from, from the building. Mm -hmm. It's the other side of those fields, the administrative right. building and the ski course, right? Well, it depends. I mean, yes, or you put the buildings on the same site and you move the athletic fields. So. So Who does knows? U32 own the land on that site? No. Not, no. not the piece that was next no. to it that okay. we saw in that piece. Okay. No. I mean, I think regardless, we, it's going to be a full day. And it will be in one. We won't be sending people back yeah. to yeah. Right. their sending school per se. They won't be trucked back or transported right. back right. or whatever. So right. if I they had access to something nearby, yeah. that would be different. Yeah. yeah. So I, th I think that bullet is fine. Okay. okay. All right, so we need a motion to adopt this vision statement for our, our new project. Where'd your camera go? Uh, do we have a motion to adopt? Sure, I'll move that. Okay, Terry. I'll second it. Terry, Jana. Um, any, let me write this down, vision statement. Um, any discussion? And it's the entire, it's the vision, the goal, the mission statement. That was just yeah. The vision. This just goes the vision, not not the rest. But all of it actually is going to go out on mm -hmm. in materials. So the only yes. question I have is about the date. Uh, or oh the yeah, twenty nine. Twenty eight. Yeah. It's twenty nine. Okay. Yeah, original goal was twenty eight. Twenty eight. But yeah. yeah. Thank you. So now we need to change that to twenty nine. All right. So to so do we have so we have um, a motion to adopt. Uh, we'll just amend it, a motion to adopt as corrected to 2029. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? Hearing none, motion carries. We have 
adopted our vision, goals, and mission statement. Very good. Now the revenue anticipation note. Big event. Revenue anticipation note, you want to explain that just for everyone? Or Michelle? Uh, so every year, uh, a lot of school districts go out to banks and they say, I'm going to be, I'm a, I anticipate I'm going to get this money. Can you please give me a loan through the summer when I don't get any money just so that I can make my payroll? You can just spend it on anything, but um, you send them their financial statements and they tell you how much of a loan amount they're allowed to give you. They charge you an interest rate. They also say whatever amount you can invest that. So once we're done, typically what would happen is in the summer we'd use this money, this cash, to get us through the summer. Then once we get our first payment in September from the state, we usually reimburse that account. When we reimburse that account, we let it sit there the rest of the year and we actually make interest rate mm -hmm. on that. So we borrow at about 4%, mm -hmm. um, but the interest is about 4.3%. That's the best that I can find right now. So. I went out to four different banks. I asked them for a request on how much money they would allow us to borrow and their interest rates. I put it together really quick. Um, I'm actually looking and I think the printed copy versus the one that I actually linked in the agenda are, oh no, they're right. Yeah, so it's 4% loan rate with an investment rate of 4.3%. I'm recommending we go with Community Bank NA. Um, the spread is the same as the other banks, but it also is a bank that we're using already, so we don't have to use new financial institutions. Uh, I would recommend that we use that, and I would also recommend that you allow um, your board chair to sign for, for that bank. Now, I just have a question. Community Bank, not NA, is saying the investment rate is 4.3. Community Bank, NA, is saying it's 4.25. Yes, that's it. Why is mine? Uh, it is 4.3. Um, okay. Last, okay. Uh, if you remember same. last month, I asked if I could come back, and that was because I was in negotiations with banks. Okay. So it's 4.3. It's 4.3. Okay. They were able to match our some other bids that we had out okay. there. I let all the banks know these are our bids. Um, I share all of our results. This bank happened to come back. You also get an infusion of money in August when the first tax bill is due, right? Yeah, so that's when it all starts. Yeah, yeah, it all starts. But that's also our first payroll with teachers. Well, right. for their next yeah. contracted amount. So, and Community Bank NA is located where? Uh, right on in Barry. In Barry, okay. Yep. That's all we need. I just wanted to be sure. Okay, so um, we need a motion to approve. The revenue anticipation note for FY25 to be obtained through Community Bank NA in Barrie, Vermont. So moved. Guy, as a first, we need a second. I'll second. All right. Jason. All right, very good. Uh, any discussion? Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? Hearing none, motion carried. We will. Um, Do we also have to authorize Jody to sign the documents? Or is that part of it? Would be me. Um, it's the yep. board chair. Oh, I mean, it's you yep. to do that. Yeah. Yep. Is that a separate motion? That yep, let's do that. Authorize okay. the board chair to sign any documents from Community Bank, between Community Bank and A, and the Central Vermont Career Center School District. So moved. All right. Second. Jana, Scott. Any discussion? Nope. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. <coughs> Any opposition? Hearing none, motion carries. Okay. We are, we have completed that bit of business. All right. Moving on to the invitation to bid for the refurbished mobile home. mobile home. We would like to be able to send this out after this meeting. <laughs> 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 
We, have, we One thing is that it, the trailer is way down at the end, and we need to move it off of that uh, Crimson Tide way before the project for the stormwater runoff that Barry Unified Union School District is doing. So we're trying as quickly as possible to turn it around. We're probably going to have to pay someone to move it, um, any, unless any of you have the equipment to move it, <laughs> over to the parking lot and then have whoever wins the bid take it away. Okay. So he, that moved, let me know. We need it moved. We really do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know how big it, what, it, what, is it a Connex box or is it a trailer? What is it? It's a mobile it's a home. It's 14 by 60. 14 by 60. Does that have a hitch on the front? Yes. It uh, came. We, we can talk offline. Okay. 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 So um, we're asking for bids to be placed by email or in an envelope, sealed bids, accepted by Michelle or I. Um, and I one of the things you might want to do as part of this since you're not meeting in july is to authorize me to choose the winner it's up to you I, you could authorize alice to do it she could come in in july um we're stating that the minimum acceptable bid for the trailer is 29.9 we did get a twenty-four thousand dollar gear f uh, grant that we need to repay um, from the governor's office minus a few tools that we're we will still have and then we also spent a significant probably close to 20,000 of our owned funds on renovating this trailer so it would be <coughs> at, a, at a loss but it, those funds would have been spent in program building something that we would have taken down anyway so it's part of that piece okay. um, the r successful bidder would be responsible to pay a 10% deposit once we notify them that they're the winning bid and the balance of their purchase would be made in cash or by a bank certified check to the business office before they could take it away um, and they're responsible for taking it away on their own we're not delivering it anywhere our ask would be that it's removed no later than august 21st so that we make sure we have room for all of the teachers coming back to park um, we let people know that there's a sales tax that applies and that there's the i forget what that's called but that statement of it could, anyone can apply for it uh, what am I missing, Michelle? I was just thinking. Is, um, the, is the interior done? No. No. It's being sold as is, where is. Mm -hmm. yeah. yep. We can take a look at it tomorrow. Who are you sending this yeah, to? Yeah, still, I mean, Good question. Still Every cheap to me. <laughs> it's going to go out. It's going to go in the paper. Yeah, yeah it's going to go in the paper. There's been a couple of... Um, I've received direct emails from folks asking about when it's going to be available and how to go about it. So I okay. told them to hang tight. Great. Okay. Let's put up a little sign behind the governor. One of the guys. I do get to speak tomorrow, so I will say that it's that we're putting it up for it is. it's up for bid. Yeah. What happens if it's not removed by August 21st? It goes to the next bidder. And, and they lose deposit. their deposit. Yeah. I mean, it seems to me the way the prices are right now, you're not going to have any trouble with getting them. It seems cheap to me, but it's yep. just me. Well. Oh, I don't think you'll end up there, though. What's that? I don't think you'll end up at 29.9. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't think. It is, but the point of the project was to help. No. Yeah. Like, absolutely. For yeah. homes. People Affordable lost housing. Homes. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. It's going to go yep. up. And it's a it's a two bedroom two bath. It's not, it's nothing fancy, but it's something a family would live Small family. A very small. Okay. Good. With we folks. Short like guy. <laughs> it's it's so nice. So, all right. No, I'm hauling it to Bulldogs tomorrow. <laughs> no. All right. We we need to have a motion to uh, authorize uh, the we'll bidding. Have to investigate that statement now. The the bidding <laughs> process for the mobile home. As, as as written, um, I need a motion to approve so the bidding moved. process. So moved. Babe. Okay, Jana. I need a second. Second. Any discussion? No. Nope. I think I will just say I think this is a wonderful project for the kids yeah, to be involved in because it's not only using their skills and their craft, 
but it also is doing something for the community. Yeah. So, and um, this also means that Jody can manage this. We yes. need to. We need to do, a do we need another, another motion. I another think. motion. Yeah. 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 So we're just authorizing the uh, the bidding process right now. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? Hearing none. Motion carries. Now, motion to authorize Jody Emerson, superintendent, to um, facilitate, facilitate the bidding, bidding process. Yep. And uh, select and the winner. And sale. select the yes. winner. Complete. Facilitate and select. Um, I need I need someone so to move. Okay. Jason, I need a second. Second. Jana. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? Motion carries. Good. Very good. Where are we in our <coughs> agenda? I move we adjourn. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, we have a motion on the floor to adjourn. <laughs> Any opposition? It's a non-discussable non motion. We, are, we have completed our meeting.